thought I would make a bit of an update video and I'm doing it out here in my shop because it's easier to film <laughs> out here than it is in my basement. I have to set up lighting and all that. Everything's ready out here. I can just go and do it. Anyway, the first thing I want to talk about is the listening room itself. Now, the very first thing that I did was I sanded the floor. This is OSB that was painted gray. The seams are a little bit uneven and there are some things that dropped on it before it was painted. I want to get all that off so it's nice and smooth and I will paint it. And what the paint does is it seals it, of course, because, I don't know, OSB really doesn't smell good. And also I think that will make the self-adhesive carpet tiles stick a little bit better. And to start laying those, I snapped a chalk line after carefully measuring out where that needs to be, where I need to start. Really what you want to wind up with are pieces on the sides and on the front and back that are not too small when you cut them so that you're not left with a little sliver of carpet tile to fit in. And I only did a little bit more than the front half of the room. And the reason why I did that was I built that stand, that equipment stand from Ash and Walnut. And that's going in there. I wanted to get a decent looking thumbnail, hopefully to try to get some views on it. Didn't work, but uh, worth the effort because the room really looks better with the carpet down. Even though it's very cheap carpet tile, uh, it actually improves the look quite a lot. And while all that was happening, I had ordered a mini DSP 4 times 10, I think it's called, and it will be able to handle the um, two open baffle four ways. That's eight, and then it has two digital uh, channels as well. So it'll be able to handle the subwoofer as well. So I've got the four ways covered and I've got the subwoofer covered. And currently I have that hooked up to power the new four way and the subwoofers, not power it, but do the crossover uh, routing and all that stuff for it. Uh, the subwoofers, the, um, the test open baffle speaker, plus the other speaker as well, the ELAC that's on the right channel that's, you know, kind of balancing it out. And I've, you know, I've been able to compare the two. And, you know, you can sit there and you can say that, okay, there really wouldn't be that much of a difference between one speaker and the other because, I mean, they're, they're full range speakers, right? So they're, they're reproducing all of the sound in that range. But there's really a big difference between the ELAC and that open baffle. The open baffle sounds more there. Okay, and this is not me exaggerating. This is not me getting this set up and being euphoric and all that and being excited for it and, and you know thinking it better than it actually is this is me with this for weeks listening to it and it's quite a lot better to listen to than the other one you can sit there and you can hear it all right now one one of my ears the right ear is a little bit worse than the other but it's not that it's the like you're getting everything over with the open baffle four-way and it just seems like the other one's kind of drab in comparison. And with the DSP, I got the new 8-inch uh, midwoofer, and I got that put in as well. And that's a lot better. I can't say it's a better frequency response, although slightly, maybe. But it's less sensitive, so it better matches the other uh, three drivers that I have in the box currently. Okay, so... Then I, you know, got that set up and I actually changed the crossover frequencies again. And of course, this is all, you know, temporary stuff. This is just me playing with it for now until I build the, the um, like, the final versions. Then I'll dial everything in perfectly. And what you're looking at here is the response for that left side speaker, the open baffle speaker, plus the subwoofer. So I'm getting full range response right across, nice and even. There's no EQ applied to any of this. And the crossover points are 80 hertz from the woofer in the open baffle to the subwoofer, 250 hertz from the midwoofer to the woofer, 750 hertz from the midwoofer to the midrange, and 3000 hertz from the midrange to the tweeter. This plot that you're looking at here is the distortion for the left side plus the subwoofer. And you can see that it's around 3.72% at around 53 hertz. And that is probably louder than I would listen to the system in the room. A little bit louder. So 
that's you could say that's the maximum I would generally listen to something unless I really crank something up and and at that point when you really crank something up you know distortion goes out the window but that's a really good figure in my opinion this plot that you're looking at here is also for distortion but it's for the uh, open baffle four-way itself without the subwoofer and you can see that the peak is at 125 hertz and the THD is 1.7 percent and again it's at that same volume as it was before and this one is the right speaker which is the ELAC for comparison and you can see that the THD is actually 3.9 percent at around 80 hertz so the second part of this video is to me talking about building an amplifier building amplifiers is something I was very much into um, a bit more than 10 years ago and I built a few and I designed the boards for them like I designed a circuit based on other circuits of course because when it comes to audio amplifiers there's nothing new under the sun one of the ones that I settled on is actually from a Luxman amplifier it's known as a folded cascode and it's quite popular among DIY uh, amplifier builders uh, using that kind of topology it's a little bit more complex and the you know say you could say that the the thing that stands out about the one that I put together is that it uses thermal track transistors and I don't seem to have one on its own here but here's a here's a board that's already put together and working and you can see that the transistors the output transistors have five leads coming out of them and the three are the normal ones base emitter and collector these are BJT's by the way uh, the other two are for a diode that's on the die itself so what you have is you have bias control through these diodes right on the device itself so very accurate uh, you don't need a, a bias generator no you you need a way to adjust it and that's what this trim pot does in here so this is what I'm going to be using mainly because like I already have this one made all right and I have a number of these by the way the thermal track uh, transistors I bought 25 of each back uh, on sale actually at the time so they're less than half the price they are now I think they're around 850 now Canadian so quite pricey for each one of those and they, each one has like three uh, like six on there and this um, this amplifier is capable of like up to 200 watts into 8 ohms and close to 400 watts into 4 ohms All right, if you want to push it that far but okay yeah I've got one right here here it is right here you can see okay so I'm using that because hey look I've got I've got more boards <laughs> than I made these are ones that I did the layout like I designed a circuit I tested I like I simulated it and then I did the board layout which is what you see here on the bottom and then I etched these boards by hand and the interesting thing about these they got copper uh, silk screen like it was a double-sided board and so I, I etched the silk screen into the top all right, so I'll put a close-up picture in there so you can see it better and then the bottom is already all tinned and the holes are all drilled so they're ready to go ready to populate the only thing is I I, I, I have to make sure that I have enough you know transistors to put in there some of the ones that I used on here I think are obsolete now even though at the time because the the original circuit the Luxman M-2 circuit had a lot of like all of everything that was on there was obsolete so you you had to you know try to come up with you know replacements for them that will fit and then adjust the operating points as you go and so I did that and I actually had this one powered up and tested so it does work and it, and it works nicely works beautifully toroid here which is a 5.3 amp at 104 so this is 52052 52, which means that you're getting 52 uh, like 104 volts DC when you, through these two not DC AC from these two leads here that might be too much actually um, I'm gonna have to have a look and see if I have another one I didn't realize it was that much but it's the right size anyway 
for two channels. All I'm building here are two channels. Because really that's all I need for what I have now. I have the Yamaha that has six channels available in multi-channel mode. You can um, use it like that. And I have the Ankyo, which is, just has two channels. So that makes uh, eight. And that would cover, like that would work for the two four ways. All I really need is something for the subwoofer. Now this admittedly is kind of over the top for a subwoofer. This, uh, the quality of this amplifier is better than you would normally use. So also I have these things here. These are from, uh, I bought these surplus at Princess Auto way back for $3.99 each. And I happen to have four of them. And I think that I can make these, the heat sinks for these. I'll put a, uh, an aluminum plate across the bottom for these to attach to. And then there's two underneath. These are the drivers and the pre-drivers. They'll mount down to that aluminum plate. And then this will mount on top of that. So that you'll have, you'll have um, roughly like this. Okay, can you see that? Roughly like that. I'll lay it out on the workbench and take a picture so you can get a better idea of what I'm talking about. So yeah, that's it. I'm taking a diversion from the speaker stuff to go into amplifier world here. Not too deeply. I was originally going to design a completely new amplifier and do that. I will do that in the future because I'm really interested in that stuff. And like this doesn't make me an expert on this, by the way. This is my way of learning electronics by doing. A lot of guys can pick up the book, read the book, and they get an understanding from that. I can do that. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I can do that. But I got this mental thing where if I'm not getting something from it, like if, if I can't put what I'm learning to use, then it's of no value to me. I need to be able to put that to use to justify learning it. Okay, maybe that's a Sherlock Holmes type thing with trivial information, you know, keeping that out of your head or whatever. But that's always been the way I've learned to do stuff by actually doing it. So I get a really good understanding of how everything works by like doing stuff like this. And it's still not complete. I don't have a complete understanding of it. And I can't explain some of the stuff here the way that someone who, especially someone that learned it earlier, like younger, would be able to and have a real academic understanding of it. Mine is more practical. Like I know what needs to be done here. Maybe some of the things that are happening here are not letter perfect, but they work. So uh, you can't argue with that. When it works, and it works well, and then that's what you're looking for.